Hi, welcome to Think Tech. We're raising public awareness on technology, energy, diversity, and globalism. This show is Center Stage. I'm your host, Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater. And we're coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu, very near Kumukuhua Theater. I'm excited to tell you that on our show this week, we are interviewing Dr. Michael Schuster, who is the curator for the East West Center here in Honolulu. I'm really excited to talk to him about what they've got going on uh, currently and about his background that led him to this fascinating work. Welcome, Dr. Schuster, Michael. Michael, please. Michael, okay. Thank you so very much for coming on the show. I'm glad to be here. I, uh, so tell us about, let's start off with, what do you have in your gallery currently? Okay, we currently have a show called uh, China Through the Lens of John Thompson, 1869 to 1872. Now this is an exhibit, an extraordinary exhibit really, because it's of photographs from China that were taken more than 150, almost 150 years ago. Oh. So they're extraordinary photographs. They haven't been seen for nearly 100 years really, or since the 1920s was the last time they had been seen at all. So they're extraordinary pictures, really showing parts of life in China that no longer exist. So it's quite, quite a phenomenal collection. Uh, Betty Yao, uh, a, a woman from Hong Kong living in, in London, discovered boxes of these glass slides that were in the Wellcome Library, which is a medical research library. And they had almost been thrown out. And when she saw them and saw the detail of the photographs, the photographs that really show women, minorities, people in the street, of course, the rich and the famous as well, from all over China. So uh, it, it's really an extraordinary exhibit, and we wanted to take advantage of the possibility to show them. That sounds fascinating. And some of the photographs are actually life size. So from these glass slides, which was an, uh, the process that was the most up-to-date technology in the er early 19th century, they were able to make really wonderful digital photographs from these and enlarge them to life-size, some of them. So they're, they're quite beautiful. Oh, my goodness. I guess I'm a little surprised that, th so there's sort of slice-of-life fo photos rather than formal portrait photos. There are some that are portraits, but they, they're also slice of life. It, he was, uh, Thompson was considered one of the beginnings of photojournalism. Oh. And uh, later he did some famous photographs in London about the street people and street life in, in 19th century London as well. But uh, the images are extraordinary. There's portraits of people. Uh, what's so amazing is the technology required so much effort at the time. You had to travel with your whole setup and you had to develop the photographs on the spot. It took 15 to 20 seconds exposure to actually photograph people in the, in, in the photographs. And then through this process called the wet collodion process, which was a chemical process, they had to be developed right on the spot. So he had to take his whole, whole setup, his whole dark room with him in order to, to do this. And he traveled all over China for about four years. So it was, it was, it's, it's really something marvelous, and, and the shots are quite beautiful. Oh, yeah. And isn't it, isn't it something that he was allowed to do that in China 150 years ago? Well, you know, after the Opium Wars, uh, China was opened to the rest of the world, which was take place in the 1850s. So after that treaty, he could go and travel because he was a British citizen. He was from Scotland originally. People are still discussing who was a citizen from where <laughs> yeah. at this point in time. But uh, he was able, through his influence and through his connections, to go into people's houses, to meet people on the street, to meet officials, etc. And apparently, he was very good at making people feel comfortable and making people feel like they would like to be shot, whether they were gamblers on the street or merchants or very wealthy women, who women were never allowed to be seen from upper class households by foreign men or by any men that were not related to them. So they're, they're really extraordinary oh, photographs. Wow. So if I wanted to see this exhibit, I come to the East West Center and, uh, well, what are, your, what are your hours? What do uh, I need to know about coming okay. there? We're open every day of the week except 
Saturday. Parking is free on Sunday. Uh, we open uh, every day from 8 till 5, except for the Sunday hours, which are from noon to 4. And we are at Burns Hall. So it's the first building on East West Road, not, not some of the other buildings that people might be more familiar with at the East West Center. Okay, yeah, and I made the mistake of, I always thought the East West Center was connected to the university. We are adjacent to the university. We share the campus, but the five buildings on our side of the road, on East West Road, are part of the East West Center. So it's not a state operated institution at all. Okay. The funds are come mostly from the federal government and from private grants. Uh, okay, okay, that was going to be my next question, so thanks for going down that path already. What else, what else will I find in the gallery? You'll also find some really wonderful photographs taken in Honolulu and the other islands uh, of the Chinese population. Uh, Doug Chong, who's from the uh, Hawaii uh, Chinese History Center, uh, has an extraordinary collection. They have an extraordinary collection of photographs, of early photographs, taken mostly at the turn of the last century. But there's some a few, a few years earlier. But the photographs we're showing are mostly of the Chinese in Hawaii as they begin to become assimilated. So you'll see people in traditional dress and later as they start to acclimatize and become more American, mm. m more, m more what, what we envision but, uh, today. But um, you'll see them in, in all the historic costumes, whether it's the bowler hats or, or whatever. Uh, but uh, they're, they're really also very profound. This is the year of um, Sun Yat-sen's 150th birthday, and uh, he uh, founded the Republic of China. He was the first president. And he was educated in Hawaii. So the influence of Hawaii is very important. And the Chinese community here was extraordinarily important and continues to be important. But it was extraordinarily important. It was more than 20% of the population in Honolulu at one time. So it's, it's very important. And uh, so you get a glimpse into that historical venue as well. They are a direct result of the chaos that was happening in China in the 19th century. That's why so many Chinese were able and needed to come out of China, the mass immigrations mm. Mm. that occurred. Um, do you get a lot of visitors? Do you have a lot of traffic there? Yeah, we do, uh, particularly on our Sunday programs. And we have at least two Sunday programs a month of, of things related to the exhibition. So then we, we get quite a bit of traffic. We also get scholars, uh, people from the university as well, people who are at the East-West Center, and people from the community. We like to do a lot of outreach to the community. We get a lot of children that come by, student groups, etc. Good. Oh, good. Do you, uh, of the people coming in, do you have a lot of tourists coming in, or is it mostly oh, residents? We don't do much with the tourist population. Mm -hmm. We're really for outreach about the subject. We, what we, our job at the East-West Center is to create better understanding between the peoples of the Asia-Pacific region and the peoples of the United States. So that, that's our job. Of course, tourists are more than welcome and tourists do come, but we don't particularly uh, work towards that population. We want to do a lot of outreach to people in Hawaii and Honolulu. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's good to hear. A anything else going on in the gallery itself right now that we need to know about? No, that, that's pretty much. We change our exhibitions every uh, three months. So uh, we do, or well, maybe four months, three and a half months. So f three times a year we create new exhibitions. We also have a regular performing arts program that reaches out to the community. So there's regular performances sometimes at Eman Center, which is a part of the East-West Center, sometimes at other venues, and then a lot of outreach to school children and, and different institutions throughout the state. Oh, um, public schools. Public schools, private schools, old age homes, you know, whatever populations that we can bridge that information and make sure that the public learns more about the Asia-Pacific region. Okay, cool. I, let's go ahead and go to our break. When we come back, I'd like to talk with you about what has your background, what has led you here? Because I know you have a background in theater also, mm -hmm. in performance. So, of course, we got to dive into that just okay. a little bit. Um, okay, so we're going to take a short break. We're going to be back with you in about 60 seconds. See you then. 
Aloha, I'm Chantal Seville, the host of The Savvy Chick Show. You can watch the show every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Honolulu time and enjoy how to be inspired and empowered. If you're a woman or girl, everyone is welcome, but it's really dedicated to you. And we look forward to seeing you. You can also find us on thinktechhawaii.com. See you soon. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me live every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha! Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching thinktechhawaii.com. I am the host of the show Rehabilitation Coming Soon. You can watch us live at thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, offering lifelong learning from passionate hosts and fascinating guests, ready to explore and explain Hawaii's place in the 21st century. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Welcome back to Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Network. If you would ever like to join us in our downtown studio here in Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu, you may do that. Just email jay at thinktechhawaii.com and he will hook you up. We're talking with Dr. Michael Schuster, curator of the gallery at the East West Center. And can we talk a little bit about you? Sure, of course. If you don't mind. Um, uh, did you grow up here? No, I didn't. I, I grew up all over, actually. So I've lived in many places in the world. All over. Military family? No, no. I moved to California when I was 16, and then I went to India, and I lived in Jerusalem for many years, and then I, I studied in Indonesia so, and in Japan. So I've, I've studied a lot all over. That's fabulous. And then I came here, and I did my doctorate work here. How, uh, what a wonderful thing to have that amount of travel involved with your education while you were so young. Uh, it was very fortunate. That's a blessing. It was <laughs> yeah. a great fortune. To be able to have that. Um, and you, so you came here. What was it that drew you here? Well, I, actually, I got a grant to study at the East West Center and finish oh. my doctorate. So I studied at the University of Hawaii and uh, focused on Asian theater. India was my specialty. It's my area of expertise, or was originally my area of expertise. Yeah. And I worked in Indian puppet theater in villages in India. So that, that's, that's my background in, oh. in, in academia. Are your parents academics? No, no, they're not at all. Well, how did this happen then? <laughs> <laughs> Are they artists? N no, no, my parents, my father was pretty eccentric, uh, so... Uh, I knew that had to be in there Of course, so, so he, he, was, uh, he could do many, many things, and he was uh, fascinated by many things in the world. So I, I think that was an encouragement. And, uh, yeah, I think that looking out. I, I had grown up in a small town and I think my parents, my father was from Europe so he wanted a larger venue and my mother was from, from the East Coast, from New York City, so I think they, uh -huh. they saw a larger world that was important for me to explore. Yeah, that's wonderful. And what drew you to theater to begin with? And then, or was it puppet theater originally? Yeah, I had been traveling in Burma and this was in the, in the early 70s. Uh, and I was walking up a very famous pagoda, and I saw an old puppet, and I just was taken with it. So I said to everyone, w where can I learn about this tradition? You know, what, what? And they said, oh, there's no one who can, can do this anymore. There's no one doing this anymore in Burma. So then I was really taken. I really thought, well, I have to learn more. And I, I went back. I was studying at UCLA at the time. I started studying theater and puppet theater. And then I went traveling again to uh, Southeast Asia and con considered and, and studied more uh, Javanese theater. And, um, you know, maybe 20 years later, I went back to Burma and actually studied. I found some people who were, had revived the tradition and met with them and studied with them. Oh. So. I uh, I'm assuming these are not sock puppets. We're talking about right. pretty elaborate. Uh, right. Are they like marionette? Type the, puppets? the Burmese puppets are marionette puppets. Uh, in Java, I studied the shadow puppet tradition, which is a very involved and court tradition uh, in Java. So, and then later, I wanted to do something more with folklore, something a little less elaborate, so a little less uh, involved technically, and a little bit more down to earth. So I had I studied in India as well. 
Oh, fabulous. And then performed? Yeah, I was a performer. Uh, I, I was a member of a theater in Jerusalem uh, for about 15 years, and we found it a puppet theater that's still going. It's international and uh, quite well known in the puppet, puppet world in, in the Middle East and in, in uh, Europe. So yeah, so I was a member of that theater for a long time, and that was a wonderful experience, and tried to integrate those traditions into something contemporary and continue to do that off and on. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. You've got a show coming up anytime soon? <laughs> I'm talking, I'm, actually my daughter and I did a show a few years ago and um, we did something about Marco Polo using traditional puppets telling this story with a contemporary kind of twist of, of objects and puppets that my daughter and I worked on together. So that was fun to teach her and to work with her. She, she, she's quite, quite talented and a good dancer, Aww. so that was, fun. that was fun. A good dancer plays into puppetry? Sure, it's all about movement, isn't it? And using oh. the body and oh. knowing how to use the body and knowing how to make some object also dance and move beautifully and gracefully in space. Interesting. Are there stock characters in, the, in this world of theater? Yeah, I think this is very stylized theater. So characters are typologies uh, because most puppets don't have vast expressions the nuance has to be uh, seen in both the movement and the sculpture of the actual item. Mm. So you can identify character types just by, if you're familiar with the tradition, just by looking at the actual form of puppet theater. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm thinking of the archetypes. Sure. The, uh, um, the lovers. Right. The, 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 rule, the strong hand, the ruler, the mm. yeah, antagonist. Yeah, I think it's not quite, because most of what I study is Asian puppet theater, there's a lot of spiritual dimension often in the puppets, which were aligned with different aspects of deity, of hero, of king, and, uh, and, and those personality. Because often those stories, particularly from the Southeast Asian and Indian repertoire, uh, tell the great epic stories from the Hindus, epic Ramayana or Mahabharata. So, oh. so, so, so very different. So, but but yeah. the typologies are not are are consistent with a lot of uh, many of the ideas that Western ideas took from were very related to some of these early stories that you could see in the Asian world as well. Okay. So you're very well traveled and well educated, and yeah. you come into the East West Center as the. Were, did you begin working there as the curator of the gallery, or was there a, a trajectory that? Well, I I had done many. You know, I, I'm old, so I got I got to do a lot of different things in my life, thankfully. <laughs> and um, I first worked at the state as a folklorist for the State Foundation of Culture of the Arts. Very next. It used to be in the same building as Kumu. Oh um, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> and uh, then later I worked as an independent folklorist, and then I was. Wait, I'm sorry. May I stop you? As a folklorist, were you telling stories? No, no. Sharing? As a fo folklorist, I was interviewing, doing ethnographic work, oh. presenting, presenting people's work, trying to understand what the ethnic communities in Hawaii were doing, and, and trying to present in a larger scope. So for instance, at one time I worked on a project about the flower traditions of Hawaii and made sure that those were available so all the, from the, all the different ethnic communities here. Okay, gotcha. And then uh, later when a position uh, became available at the center, they were looking for someone who had a background in, in Asian culture, which is very important to me, clearly, and uh, I got the position as the uh, curator. Uh, it was about 12 years ago. 12 years ago. So. Oh, okay. Uh, could we go back to the flower cultures a little bit? What sure. Are, when you talk about flower culture, I'm really ignorant. I know that they look very different than what we have on the mainland when you, you know, okay. order up a spread for Valentine's well, Day. Well, you think of the <laughs> lay traditions here, or Ikebana from Japan, or the Narcissus carving from China or some of the Lao temple arrangements. Th those were the kind of traditions I was looking at okay. at that time. Okay. Uh, and then, so as curator, are you still traveling and seeking out new pieces to sure, bring in? Sure, sure. 
Uh, yeah, I, we're, <laughs> we're just, we're actually, we're going to be opening in the fall an exhibition about Okinawa, and we're, and we're working with the Okinawa and Prefecture uh, Arts University there. And so we'll be doing an exhibition about Okinawan art in the fall and in the spring where we're, I'm working with someone in Yangon in Burma to show something about what's been going on with globalization in Yangon, which is the capital city, which was for 40 years untouched, or 50 years really, and now with globalization, what that's doing to historic architecture and colonial mm -hmm. architecture there. So we're working on that. We'll be working on, you know, a, a number of projects that I'm working on in the fall. I'll be doing something about Indian textiles. And in the summer, I'm going to be doing, again, something about uh, the Tree of Life as a motif in different arts throughout Asia. So those are all with different collaborators that we work through. Yeah. And uh, is it... So is it you are making decisions about here's something that I'd like to bring at in next summer or are there grand tours or are there other projects that are helping to make those decisions? No, I usually make the decision of what we'll be producing, what, what, what will be, I usually make the curatorial decisions. So it depends. Most of the time, I'd say about more than three quarters of the time, I've decided and I've studied the situation. I'll have gone to places and seen materials, often collecting the materials myself. So for instance, we did an exhibition uh, with some, w in Nepal. So I had to go to the villages in Nepal and go into the mountains and look for the materials to actually bring and work with photographers to show how people's lives are. So that's something that I worked mm -hmm. very closely with, with people. Uh, and people from the Nepal Foundation from here in Hawaii, which there's a foundation, to, to make contact and work with people. On the other hand, sometimes the exhibitions have already been developed, and then I will just you know, make sure that they're appropriate for what we want to show here. So it, it's both, it, but it's usually a collaborative process, either with individual collectors or, or uh, larger institutions. Were you a part of, uh, we just had a couple of major earthquakes in Nepal last year, were you a part of any sort of effort to reclaim or see what, if any of the art was damaged? Um, we were part of helping with a little fundraiser because I'd already done my, my uh, research work just the year before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, the villages that I was involved with, some of the artifacts that we collected were, were, were sold. And, and the money donated to those villages that were, were in, who had suffered from, oh. from that experience. Oh, that's wonderful. To, that brings art up to a whole new level when uh -huh. you can actually help the people who have created sure. it sure. along the line. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty awesome. What, um, we just have a couple of more minutes left here. See, it went really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you have, wh where is where's your next journey? What's the next, we know, okay, the shows that you have coming up, but what's on the larger horizon for you in the East-West Center? Well, I can speak about what's going on with me personally. Uh, I will be working on a project, like I said, in Yangon. So in the, in the fall, I will be probably traveling to Burma to, or Myanmar uh, to, to work on, on this project that I've been working on. And, um, and that's in collaboration with some of my colleagues at the East-West Center who are already doing uh, leadership training in, in, in uh, Myanmar. So I'll be going with them and then I'll be continuing doing research for that project and making sure that it, it, it goes well. And uh, we are lucky. And I have some very close friends who are there who have written a book and well, I'll be working with them on making sure the artifacts and photographs come, come here. That make it here, yeah. yeah. So do, how, how involved do you get with issues of political unrest or the refugee issues that are going on in Myanmar? Uh, I don't get too involved with uh, the politics of the situation um, other than I'm aware, you know, I know people, the situation, but I, I really try to stay involved with the cultural aspects of people and creating that link and understanding. Uh, the greater political issues uh, I leave to other people to try to decide. And I, I just want to make that human contact so mm. we can ha have a deeper understanding of all of us as human beings. That's, that's cool. That's, that's a good point to put on it. So we're, we're going to wrap up here looking at some pictures of uh, 
These are some of the images that you have in the gallery right now. No, these are yes. actually images that are going to be uh, from the Okinawan exhibit. Oh, you and know, the, we're doing an Okinawan show at Kumakuvoi Theater this fall. Our timing is probably sublime. Great. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Oh, beautiful. that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We'll definitely have to talk some more. Uh, so, okay, so these are in the show that are coming up. Beautiful. We'll, is that a sculpture? No, that's a woman who's dancing. And she will, and we will be showing. Oh, gosh all of these uh, beautiful performances. There will be a performances at the East-West Center as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's uh, we'll most definitely stay in touch. Okay. I'm looking forward to hearing about your travels. I really appreciate that you don't want to get involved in the political front and just by helping to preserve and share those cultures, you, you are doing your part really wonderfully, I think, okay. you know, to, to show us that we all really have something to stand up for and work on preserving. Um, and we, uh, if, if someone wants to get involved, if someone wants to visit the East-West Center, where should they go to learn more information about that? They can just look at the East-West Center website. It's uh, eastwestcenter.org, and they can find us, or eastwestcenter.org, and then look for the arts page as well, which is separate. Look for the arts page there. And every, all of the information that you have on the performances is also listed there. Yeah, yes. If someone wanted to get involved, do you use volunteers there? Uh, the East West Center has a friends program, so you can call call the East West Center, and um, you know they will give you uh, information of how to join Friends of East West Center. Awesome! They will hook you up. I'm definitely going to make a point of coming over to see the exhibit. I'm Correct. glad that we got acquainted. I'm glad that I knew. I now know it's not a part of the university. Right. Glad to hear that you're supported so well by the state too. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. That's all for Center Stage today. I am your host Donna Blanchard. I thank you for being here. There's a few other people that I would like to thank in the room. I'd like to thank Rich Prapis who's our floor manager who's right over there. Thanks Rich. We have two interns running around here somewhere. I don't know where they went. Oh they're in the big room. That's Diamond and Haley, thank you very much, girls. And I'd also like to thank Zuri, our studio overlord, who is in my ear, and Jay Fidel, who somehow manages to put all of this together. If you would ever like to join us in the studio audience, email Jay at j at thinktechhawaii.com. If you would ever like to be a part of the show or you know someone who you believe Donna really should be interviewing on that show, then please get in touch with me. You can do that via Twitter at um, it's, all Don it's All About Donna. How could I possibly forget that? Because it is all about Donna. You can also connect to me at Kumakuhua Theater, and that's kumakuhua.org online. Thank you very much, and we will see you next Wednesday on Center Stage. Bye.